Thank you very much. Um, so I'm declare my interest first. I'm not a solar physicist or a historian. I'm a particle physicist. But I think the reason I've been asked to sum up is because um, I work part-time at the Science Museum where we're developing an exhibition about the sun, which is tentatively slate, slated for 2018 or 19. I think I can say that now that our boss has gone. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, which will coincide very nicely with what um, the last two speakers were talking about, the Solar Orbiter and Solar Pro Plus, so if, assuming they've hit their launch dates. So I'm, I'm really excited. This isn't going to be, uh, hopefully this is going to be something vaguely intelligent, but it's really going to sort of pick out what I found interesting about all of the talks today. And first of all, I thank all the speakers for a really, really interesting day of, of, of talks. But I mean, one thing that struck me is actually how little we knew about the sun until relatively recently. If you think that before sort of 19, the mid-1920s, we didn't know what the sun was. I mean, in a sense, we, became, we knew it was a star, but we didn't know what it was made of. We had the sort of, from spectroscopy, we knew broadly it was made of the same elements or contained the same elements as the Earth, but in what proportions, we didn't know. And we didn't know where its energy came from. And that's quite remarkable for an astronomical object that people have been familiar with for, you know, since the year dot. I think mean, that's quite an interesting thing. So really, in the last 100 years, our knowledge of the sun, which has basically gone from knowing that it's a bright thing in the sky a certain distance away and that the planets go around it, to actually now really understanding where its energy comes from uh, and, and now in the last 50 or 60 years actually studying in detail the sort of in the really beautiful structures that you see on its surface. So I think that's quite, that's quite an interesting point. The other thing, I mean, uh, one of the things as we've been doing a bit of research into this subject is if you go back to 1800 and William Herschel who discovered amongst other things Uranus and uh, the infrared spectrum um, or actually thought the sun was an inhabited body, which seems a crazy thing to us now, knowing that its surface temperature is 6,000 Kelvin. But, I mean, the idea that it's, that's not so long ago, really, 200 years. And you think of 1800 as being a relatively advanced point in history of sort of industrial technology, but people are still thinking at that time that the sun could be a planet and that you had people walking about on its surface. And that's, I think that's quite a remarkable thing. Um, the other thing that struck me, actually, is that a lot of the major breakthroughs actually came from not looking at the sun, which is quite surprising. I mean... If you think about uh, when we were talking about the, the first talk today, um, uh, so there's the second talk from, from David from David Wooten about uh, the sort of the, the Tychonic and the uh, Copernican system, and actually these two systems being totally equivalent and indistinguishable from other, each other based on observational means alone, actually the breakthrough comes when you start to apply physical theory to these two models. But once you have Newton's law of gravity, it's then you can actually say, well, okay, the Copernican system is the only one make, that makes sense because the Tychonic system would involve fictional forces in a rotating frame. So I, I think, and, and that's actually true if you look even more dramatically, this big question of where does the sun's energy come from, that almost comes from studying without any reference to the sun at all. I mean, it really, it's kind of... The, the, the big debate is between in the, in the 19th century between the physicists and Lord Kelvin and then the geologists and the evolutionary biologists. You have you know, Darwin and Huxley. And it's more about the age of the Earth and allowing for geological processes to take place, allowing for life to evolve. And then you have a physicist who isn't an astronomer talking about you know, the energy gener generating mechanisms. And then the actual discovery of both uh, the composition of the sun, which comes from spectroscopy, which is ultimately, it was originally a sort of branch of chemistry and optics, really, and not, again, not of astronomy, and then quantum mechanics, which is completely divorced from astronomy, and astronomers, as, 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 um, as uh, Helga Krah said, didn't really have much understanding of, of mathematical physics. So I think the importance, actually, of mathematical physical theory in teaching us about the sun without really looking at it, I think that's quite an interesting feature. And actually, we've only really started to look at the sun um, you know, at the end of the day, we took the, the talks from, um, from Andre and, uh, and Philippa about actual observations have only really begun in earnest in the last sort of 50, 60 years with the advent of space-based observatories. Before that, I guess you have the observations of spot sunspots and these coronal mass ejections, which you can see during eclipses, but otherwise we knew very little about this incredible structures that we now see on the surface of the sun. So I, th I think that's been quite an interesting, interesting pattern. Um, and I, th I think also... If you look at where these observational techniques came from, so telescopes which Galileo used to observe particularly the, the, the phases of Venus are not, dis are not built originally to look at the stars or the sun, they're built to, for military purposes. Um, spectroscopy developed by Fraunhofer comes out of a desire to make achromatic telescopes and, and it's not actually, again, it's discovered sort of serendipitously. These spectral lines come as an accident as a result of some other endeavour. And the same thing with the discovery of nuclear fusion. That comes from the study of atoms and particles and then it reveals something about, um, <coughs> about the sun's deep interior which is totally inaccessible observationally. So I think all of those things are really quite interesting. Um, and also how, how little we still, we still know about the sun. So I think hopefully, hopefully that's vaguely intelligent. That was kind of what I took away from it. But I think what we want to do now, if we can open it up for some questions and discussions, and I think quite a few of the speakers are still here, so they've 
I, I can try and answer some questions, but they'd be much better informed than I will. So um, are there any questions or thoughts or contributions? I have one question. Yeah. You're from Cambridge, are you? Yeah. Are you get struck down by a bolt of lightning? <laughs> <laughs> I think the rivalry is over is overstated, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>